U.S.-Iran relations. In 1953, Eisenhower and the British overthrew the democratically elected leader of Iran, Mohammad Mossadegh, and ever since then, we have had a torturous, if not a very dangerous and idiotic relationship with Iran, leading up to the fall of the Shah, whom we installed in 1953, in 1979, and the taking of hostages from our embassy and the holding of them for 444 days and the ruination of our president, Jimmy Carter. And that even intensified the hatred and the dislike, and we haven't uh, managed to break that vicious uh, relationship up and deal with each other on a normal basis since. Let me just say first that that does not just relate to Donald Trump. In November of 2015, in the seventh year of eight years of President Barack Obama, he sat across the table from me in the Roosevelt Room, along with then Secretary of State John Kerry, and he said, quote, there's a bias in this town toward war, unquote. And then he spent the next 30 minutes trying to explain that bias and how he felt more or less helpless confronting it. Uh, You must remember this is after Hillary Clinton had gotten him into the the debacle of Libya. It was after John Kerry had tried just as hard as Hillary did, but unsuccessfully, to get him to put major ground forces in Syria. So here's a president whom I consider to be reasonably wise, reasonably intelligent, telling me in the Roosevelt Room that there's a bias in Washington toward war. And of course, he meant the same thing Donald Trump meant, only writ larger. It's not just a military industrial complex. It's the national security elite, Democrat or Republican. Doesn't matter if it's Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. We love war. We live for war. We prosecute war now all told for 18 years, we don't seem to be able to break out of that construct. We are a state whose raison d'etre is making war on a good portion of the rest of the world. The main one, of course, is my old <laughs> compatriot from the State Department in 2001, 2, 3, and 4, John Bolton, who has made no secret at all publicly announcing his desire for war with Iran about his desire to bring uh, the regime down in Tehran by whatever means. Um, there are others, though, and they are formidable. One is Bibi Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel. Uh, One is Mohammed bin Salman, the current uh, anointed heir in Saudi Arabia, and his buddy, uh, MBZ, in the United Arab Emirates, uh, the Foundation for Defense of Democracies in Washington, which should be called the Foundation for the Furtherment of Israel's Aggrandizement in the Middle East. Um, There are all manner of people arrayed around this president who I think fundamentally does not want war with Iran, who do in fact want war with Iran. Uh, This president wants to sit down with President Rouhani, Foreign Minister Zarif, and whomever else the Iranians might bring to the table, and he wants to negotiate, and he wants to leap up at the end of those negotiations, maybe an hour into them, and he wants to say, see, I told you I could get a better deal than President Obama. And it won't matter that the deal is the same deal or a different deal or whatever. It's just the political exultation that Donald Trump wants about having achieved the deal. He does not want war. He wants to go back to negotiations. And frankly, if it weren't for these other forces within his administration and on the outside who want bombs dropped on Tehran, Um, I believe he might be able to achieve it, though the Iranians are not inclined, as was Kim Jong-un, to do it. And and he's making a mistake, of course, in associating Rouhani and Zarif with Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-un wanted, above all else, 
to be recognized, to sit down with an American president and be recognized. And, of course, he achieved that. Uh, Rouhani and Zarif have no such expectation and no such desire. So it's going to be extremely hard for Donald Trump to achieve negotiations, and that worries me because these other people underneath his inattention are striving for at least bombs and, and maybe something even more widespread, maybe general war. I think it would be catastrophic, even more so than the clear catastrophe that we initiated with the invasion of Iraq in 2003. And to your question directly, could it break out? Even though the president is not inclined toward, and I don't think at all wants a war with Iran, he wants negotiations, the forces that are arrayed in the Gulf now and the naval assets in particular really concern me because we could come up with an incident almost at the drop of a pin, um, either initiated by uh, an IRGC or other Iranian element at sea, or a false flag operation by any one of those three characters I mentioned before, MBZ, MBS, and Bibi Netanyahu. Um, Any of these things could, any of these people could uh, bring about a set of circumstances that would be a, a so-called Tonkin Gulf, as it was in the Vietnam War. It would be a fabricated false flag, we call it, operation. Uh, but it would be enough to get Donald Trump to start thinking about uh, different things than negotiations. And that that's what worries me. The The real problem with that, of course, is not so much that bombs might fall or that military action might take place. The problem is that it won't do anything. And I think it's going to be very, very difficult to hide that. Donald Trump will try to hide it, as he did with Syria when he rained the cruise missiles down on Syria and tried to proclaim that that was an effective action. It certainly wasn't an effective action. Um, But this, this will not be an effective action in a way that is demonstrable to the American people, to the region and the world. So he'll have only one choice, or he'll have two choices at that point either back down and say it was a a good lesson or whatever, as he did with Syria, or go in for more. And what worries me there, again, is that he'll go in for more. And, and, And if more is boots on the ground, if more is an invasion of Iran, as happened with Iraq in 2003, then we're looking for a regional disaster, and we're looking for, ultimately, I think, global implications for that disaster, because that will probably bring in Russia, it will no doubt bring in China, it will bring in Turkey, we will have what looks initially at least like a really bloody, violent regional war that turns out to be more region and more region and more region, (laughs) reaching from Ankara to Riyadh, over to Djibouti and up maybe even to the Suez, and eventually we might even have a global conflict. This is not something that we all should be welcoming in any way, fashion, or form. It's a very dangerous situation. Iran is almost four times as big as Iraq. Its terrain is nothing like Iraq's. It's very mountainous. I did the war planning for Iran back in the 80s when we were very fearful that the Russians would leave Afghanistan and come into Iran. And we'd have to fight the Russians in Iran in those Zagros Mountains, for example. And I know from that war planning effort how difficult it is to fight in Iran. So this is not something we want. Um, We need uh, a really concerted and wise and intelligent diplomatic effort right now. We need a lot of parties involved. I'm very depressed with the Europeans. Uh, whether it's Federica Mogherini originally and the European Union, or it's Germany or France or Britain or Belgium, very de- depressed with them because together they have a GDP that is equal to or surpasses our own. And they certainly have enormous financial and economic power, but they have severed or are in the process of severing, tearing up discarding their political power because they can't agree on so many things with Brexit being the leading example. 
So the European Union, which has the political might and the economic and financial might to stand up to the United States, is not doing so. And all the things that they've offered Iran to try and keep the JCPOA, the nuclear agreement, alive are feckless. They're not doing much good. Uh, as a matter of fact, now China, to a lesser extent, India, Turkey, and others are doing more good by defying the United States and resuming buying Iranian oil. I say more power to them to do that because otherwise Iran's going to be put into a situation where um, it's going to be really dicey as to whether or not they can, uh, their, their people can survive in a way that they, they, they should. The, the government is ripping them off majorly, one of the most corrupt governments in the world. Um, there's a recent study done by the uh, Hinckley Institute at the University of Utah in our state of Utah. Um, and it shows that the Iranian IRGC, Quds Force, Judiciary, Majlis, and others are ripping off the Iranian oil industry for at least 500 billion, perhaps in some years even a trillion dollars, that doesn't go to the Iranian people, to infrastructure refurbishment, to medical care, to education, and so forth. It goes into the coffers of these corrupt ayatollahs, corrupt uh, mullahs, and so forth, and it's being stolen from the American people. So the, the, the most powerful thing anyone could do in Iran right now is to alert the Iranian people increasingly to what's happening to them and let the Iranian people in a, in a more or less democratic way, even if it, even if it is a, a revolutionary way, overthrow this very corrupt government. Uh, all we'll do if we start a war with them is solidify 80 million people in their hatred of us and make them back their government by necessity. This is, this is just stupid. This is insane. But Donald Trump is not known to be the most wise president in the history of the United States by any means. Well, it's targeting the elite. The sanctions the U.S. has on Iran are targeting the elite in the sense that it's making them richer and richer, as sanctions often do. Uh, in terms of the Iranian people, it's making them poorer and poorer and lacking humanitarian aid, lacking medical facilities and medical treatment and so forth. And this is, this is truly unwise at a time when polls out of Iran are showing that for the first time since 1979, the most strident, the most uh, forward-leaning support for the revolutionary government is the lower one-third of the Iranian population, lower one-third in affluence and in education. They are the most, quote, Islamic, unquote. And so they are the most powerful support for the Ayatollah and his regime. Polls are showing now that they even are questioning the government, largely because of corruption. They are aware of the corruption, they don't like it, and they are questioning the leadership of the regime for that reason. So you now have a fairly solid, in all three affluence, education, and other matters of judgment, uh, uh, tiers of Iranian society, you have a solid front that is opposed to the revolutionary government. This is not the time to attack that government and to solidify 80 million Iranians in their support of it. This is the time to exacerbate that divide and invite the Iranian people to overthrow that government. That's, that would be the wise course of action, the wise uh, way to go. But that doesn't seem to be uh, something that this, this country is thinking about. I think European countries have the same problem the United States Congress has. They lack the political and moral courage to take the right action. Now, all the things you've cited are the reasons that they lack that political and moral courage, but they are not obstacles that are not overcomable. Uh, 
Um, if, if the European Union wanted to get its political act together, even if they're only momentarily for this kind of action, then it, it could throw up, along with the Chinese and the Russians, mind you, um, it could throw up formidable opposition to everything from the United States SWIFT system, its financial transaction system, to uh, other ignominious aspects of our foreign policy in the world today. You know, Charles de Gaulle was the one that said the dollar was the most vicious weapon America wielded. Well, it has become not only vicious, but very dangerous to the rest of the world these days. So there needs to be some movement in the world to balance the United States in terms of financial power. And there's plenty, plenty of opportunity out there with Remimbi, with Euros, with whatever a consortium of countries who got together to do it, uh, call it the G19 minus the United States, there's plenty of power out there, but there's no political courage nor moral courage to wield that power. And there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear in Germany of being too close to Russia, a lot of fear in France of being uh, Germany's being too close to Russia. Um, the kinds of fears that have haunted Europe for years, hundreds of years, centuries, are haunting it once again and keeping it from wielding the unified power that it should be able to wield. Um, it's a lack of moral and political courage, frankly. I, I realize the obstacles are, are, are quite, uh, they, they are extremely difficult to navigate, to negotiate, but they are not impossible. And I, I fully expect any moment for some European leader to stand up and say, this is, this is unacceptable. This is flat unacceptable. We must get together and we must counter this. But I haven't seen it yet. When you look at it, you, you wouldn't think that it would lead to the kind of war that World War II was, uh, the kind of kinetic war, the kind of bombs dropping everywhere, the kind of 24-7 uh, war, the kind of war that all of us think about when we think about, quote, war, unquote. I don't think that's what it would lead to, but I do think it could lead to global conflict that would look a lot like World War II in terms of the casualties produced and the destruction done, but it would be far faster, far more profound even, and it would last a lot longer, and it would destabilize the entire region and perhaps even a good portion of the globe because we're talking about nations like China, Russia, the United States, Germany, France, England, having the ability to conduct a new kind of war, a war over computers, if you will, a war over networks, a, a war that takes place as much in the banking industry of the world as it does on battlefields. When we decide to do that, and uh, one of the things I rue right now is the United States is already doing that and doing it in a rather formidable way. And it, it's got lots of repercussions that are come back, gonna come back on the United States, I'm sure, when the rest of the world figures it out. The Chinese have already figured it out and they're working right now, I'm sure, in the Central Party School and elsewhere on strategies to combat it. But you can't keep doing this kind of thing in the world with economic science. We, we are, in effect, conducting economic warfare on much of the world right now. Um, we are better at it than anyone else. And don't let anyone kid you on that. We are. We are far more formidable with the tools we've developed in the so-called global war on terror. I know I was there when we developed some of those tools. We are far more skilled at using those tools. And as a consequence, a lot of the rest of the world is frightened uh, as to what we might do if, if we really got involved in a conflict like I'm talking about. But the tendency of war over, over historical time is that once it's wielded, once, once the kind of war is clearly uh, known to other countries, then they, they jump in and they begin fighting the same kind of war. And what the world has yet to figure out is that we are more vulnerable than any of them separately and to a lot of them even together to this kind of warfare once it is accepted by them and once it is used. And the bullshit about Russia interfering in the elections in 2016 was just that, bullshit. 
Um, Russia did what Russia usually does with a little more expertise and a little more technical skill, but no more than that. But what was indicated as having been done is what could be being done by countries all across the globe. So we're talking about that kind of effort from China, from India, from Russia, from Turkey, from the United States, from Saudi Arabia even, uh, and other countries in the region. And it, it'll have casualties and it'll have battlefields, yes, but they won't be the principal aspects of it. The principal aspect of these conflicts are going to be banks, the financial system, whole networks, power grids, distribution systems, transportation networks, and so forth. And when those things start collapsing, then the global economy starts collapsing. And we have the potential through this kind of warfare to bring about a really, really bad situation. And let's just look at what that bad situation would be confronting once it was developing. Climate change. So here we are confronting perhaps an existential threat to all of us, to, very, to the very aspect of human life, maybe even life in general, on this planet, and we are tearing each other apart with this kind of warfare. This makes no sense. It will just deepen and make more profound the impact of climate change and may hasten our demise. It may hasten our disappearance from this planet. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. We have 65 million. I was just talking to one of my UN friends yesterday. We have 65 million refugees in the world right now, building towards 100 million. We are looking at a situation now where even agencies like those who do this from years of experience are predicting by, by just a third of the way through the century, and certainly by the halfway point, 500 million to a billion refugees in the world. Many of them are going to start being refugees because of climate change, desertification, acidification of the seas, um, no arable land, no potable water, and so forth. And a lot of this is from our satellite imagery and from our modeling, which is becoming more and more sophisticated. A lot of this is going to start in Southwest Asia, the very region we're talking about. So you're talking about 500 million refugees, half of whom will be male, and probably a third of that male will be under 35 and carrying a Kalashnikov with at least 20 rounds of ammunition. This is not a situation that we should be uh, ignoring at this moment, not a situation that we shouldn't be preparing for and trying to ameliorate as much as possible. And yet I look to Washington and Washington doesn't even care that it's happening. We're talking about a slightly different situation. If you recall, Iraq and Iran fought a very bloody war for eight years, and neither could uh, pull off a victory. And when the United States attacked Iraq in 1991, uh, it was over in a matter of days, some would say a matter of hours. Um, so it would look as if there is a great uh, military differential between the United States and Iran. And Technically speaking, there is. The United States could bomb Iran around the clock. Uh, it could run its bomb factories forever and just keep bombing Iran. But what would that produce? Let's just ask the question, what would it produce? It would produce three really deadly outcomes. One, it would solidify 80 million Iranians of all ages, sexes, and affiliations around their government. Two, it would drive Iranian engineers and scientists underground. They know what Kim Jong-un did underground in North Korea, and they would develop a nuclear weapon probably inside a year. And three, it would give the United States no option, but when that bombing ceased, no matter how destructive it had been on the surface, to invade. That would be the only way the United States could root out Iran's nuclear program and ensure that it didn't have a nuclear weapon. An invasion will be two to four trillion dollars, 10 years, half a million troops, full mobilization of the United States with conscription, 
probably cause a revolution in this country when we implement conscription, much the way it did in 1863 when Lincoln had to send a whole division of Union troops to New York City just to stop the draft riots, and we would be in a mess. We would be in a complete mess. The region would be in a mess, and as we said before, we might even be headed for some sort of global conflict. So this is not something anybody should be contemplating. Now, to your question as to whether Iran is better today, absolutely. Look at what Iran has been doing since we gave them the opportunity. When we eliminated Saddam Hussein in 2003, we drastically changed the balance of power in the Persian Gulf. We put Iran in the strategic hegemon seat. Ever since then, Iran has been exercising that hegemony with its IRGC and Quds Force in places like Syria and Iraq, and it has become very good at that exercise. And so today they have uh, formidable forces that could fight a guerrilla warfare uh, against the United States and ultimately probably prevail. It, it would be worse than Vietnam. It would be worse than anything the United States has failed in since Korea. So we're talking about any way you cut the cake, a really catastrophic strategic situation for the United States if it commences hostilities with Iran. You never know what some sort of movement like that is going to do. I was in London uh, in 2002 and 2003, and I've never seen anything like it. I mean, bobbies on horses couldn't even move because the people were so thick in their protest. And, and you're right, George W. Bush and his gang, uh, myself included in that gang, we went right ahead uh, on and invaded Iraq. I don't know if that sort of a movement took place again, that it would be such a cavalier movement to war, though. I watched what happened in America when both the Congress and the president, in this case, Barack Obama, were very much on the verge of putting major U.S. ground forces in Syria. And what happened was hundreds of thousands of emails, phone calls, constituent visits, and so forth from all over the country to the Congress and many stopped off at the White House. And I have leaders from both White House Times and Congressional Times who have told me that that's what stopped President Obama. And in fact, that day in the White House in the Roosevelt Room, President Obama said the same thing. That's what stopped him from putting major ground forces in Syria, it was an uprising of the American people that said, don't do this, simply don't do this. So I, I don't discount the, the effectiveness, if it's uh, well done, of uh, uh, regional, global protest about these sorts of things happening. I, something's got to be done. I mean, you, we can't keep doing this sort of thing and expect that we're going to survive. And when I say we, I mean the United States as an empire, and I mean the, the world and humans and their life on this planet. This is really getting bad. I belong to a group called the Climate and Security Working Group, which is mostly Department of Defense people. It's Navy, it's Marine Corps, it's Homeland Security to a certain extent, but it's, it's people who are worried principally right now about sea rise and about what it's going to do to mil military installations uh, on the coast of the United States and around the world in the over 800 places that we have bases in the world. Um, it's a serious situation. We're, we're looking at facilities right now, for example, millions of dollars, in one case, billions of dollars worth of facilities that are going to be, have to be relocated, rebuilt inland and so forth because of sea rise. So we're looking at this entire panoply of things that are coming down the road towards us as a result of climate change. It's serious stuff. And it's really kind of lamentable that in the United States, the only government entity that really understands this and is moving out to take action is the Department of Defense. It's despicable that that's the only government entity that really is doing anything. Um, but that's, that's the reality here in this country. I hope it's not the reality in other countries. I hope other countries look at this as, as the serious coming that it is and are doing things to uh, try, try and ameliorate, if not adapt, both probably, 
um, we were just down in Norfolk, Virginia. I'm going down to Norfolk tomorrow. And uh, those are the largest naval shipyards in the United States, and they're in trouble. Um, we're either going to have to build a huge wall at great expense, or we're going to have to relocate a lot of those facilities at even greater expense. So this business of climate change is very much felt by the United States Armed Forces.